My name is Sam Cavanaugh, and I'm the Spiritual and Community Life Program Manager at Emmanuel College in Victoria University. I started my position in June. As part of this role, I am responsible for offering non-academic student support. So that looks like some pastoral care, some spiritual care, kind of directing students to various resources available on and off campus. I'm also responsible for coordinating and sometimes facilitating the spiritual and community life of our college. So this past semester that has included gatherings on four out of five days of the week. On Mondays, we meet for Buddhist ritual and meditative practices. On Tuesdays, we meet for midday prayer. On most Wednesdays, we meet for Christian chapel or sometimes interfaith gatherings. And on Thursdays, we've started this uh, new session, this, this term called contemplative community practices. So that looks like meditative and contemplative practices from across and sometimes in between our traditions. I am also co-teaching in the multi-religious theological education and leadership cohort course this term, as well as teaching the ritual um, and worship practicum, which is a course associated with the spiritual life team. Spiritual life team is the new name that we're using for what was formerly called the worship team. We are a collective of interfaith students and myself as we together plan and coordinate the spiritual life of the college. For both of the courses that I'm teaching, so we're involved in teaching multi-religious theological education and leadership, as well as the worship practicum, we meet synchronously, which is to say in real time via Zoom. And for the cohort course, there are modules associated with learning that happen outside of class time, but we meet regularly on a weekly basis, either in small groups or as a plenary. Um, and for the worship practicum, we meet every, mostly every week for about an hour and a half to reflect on practices from the previous week and to plan for what's ahead. I think some of the challenges associated with remote learning, synchronous learning in particular, are, um, are <laughs> the limits that we have as human beings for sitting in front of a screen, um, which we can't quite find workarounds for. We can you know, bring in body breaks, we can take pauses between, um, between classes or within classes even, but still it's it takes a toll, a physical toll on the body to be learning in this way. And we are seeing the effects of that now, especially at the end of term, as we've been going about this for, for a semester now for four months and our eyes are hurting, our backs are hurting. The physical cost of this learning is real. And that stands out to me as probably the largest kind of implication of remote learning. But added to that, there is, you know, this real longing for in-person connection so and then we can't quite replicate that in our online environments it's not to say that there is an intimacy and friendship and relationship building that happens in synchronous online learning um, but there is a difference between uh, having our full bodies in the room together and having our faces in the screen and some of that cost is just sort of those informal modes of connection that happen when we're in the same room together uh, the, you know noticing how people are in a room together and sort of the the creative um, possibilities that emerge when we are together in one space those are those are things that we can't that we're longing for that i'm longing for and the students are longing for as well because we're apart from each other um, because we're a lot unable to gather together from different corners of the earth it's been really remarkable to have those different corners of the earth enter into our learning space that as the classroom reveals itself to be, in fact, quite a global community. So in uh, the cohort course, the multi-religious theological education course, in my small group, we have a student from Pakistan who joins from class at, at three in the morning. And just last class, after we'd had a discussion in the plenary session around interfaith ritual and the arts and the capacity for arts to generate community between us, um, the student asked us to just pause for a moment and listen. And we could hear the call to prayer in the background in Karachi where she's joining us from. And so there's these moments of transcendence that are, that are possible in this configuration that we share now too, is that the longer we go and the more we're able to, to listen to what's happening in each of those spaces, um, you know, we get the sense of, of the world as, as the learning community, not just the classroom as like a little room where we gather, but really, the con including context beyond our own into the space that we share. The groups that I teach within are small. So there is the capacity for real relationships and a vulnerability to emerge. And because this has been a hard time, there has been the need for support within the classroom space. And so there's been 
you know, people need each other more than maybe we did before. We realize the need in a different way right now. And so there's been the capacity for those small classroom learning environments to hold some of that in, in unique ways, because um, in order to share space equitably you know, on Zoom, we have to really just not talk over each other because it literally does not work. So we have to pay attention to each other, which is one of the surprising gifts of this format is that we have to really just let each person have their have their space and time. And so with that, I think it has allowed people to open up because they've needed to, and also because this format allows for that in a unique way. So one of the ways that I know that I need to take care in this particular time is to, because you know, Zoom lends itself to certain sense experiences, namely sight, to find time to pay attention and let the rest of my sensations get a, t a chance to experience because uh, this is a really, uh, listening and sight are the only really real ones that are kind of embodied in this space. So I have been intentional about going for walks in the forest, going for walks to the beach and really letting sensory experience take over. Um, and so I have a poem that sort of speaks to this invitation towards sensory experience. And it's from um, Rabindranath Tagore's Gita Jali. And it's the 73rd poem in that collection. Deliverance is not for me in renunciation. I feel the embrace of freedom in a thousand bonds of delight. Thou ever pourest for me the fresh draught of thy wine of various colors and fragrance, filling this earthen vessel to the brim. My world will light its hundred different lamps with thy flame and place them before the altar of thy temple. No, I will never shut the door of my senses. The delights of sights and hearing and touch will bear thy delight. Yes, all my illusions will burn into illumination of joy and all my desires ripen into fruits of love. So I try to remember this invocation towards experiencing as a, as a way of experiencing delight through through the body um, as I leave the screen at the end of every day, or sometimes in between the tasks of the day. That's the other thing is to find space between the heavy computer demands of the day because the work is not gonna be done. And so to wait for the time to experience the body until the work is done, costs the body and it costs the work. I think to take space for, for that uh, full bodied experience um, enables us to continue in this in this form of meeting and gathering. Yeah, so that would be my my pastoral advice is to to make space for the body beyond what the computer allows. <laughs>